Salutations, everyone! Welcome back to Victoria 3. I'm Lord Portland, and today we have a guide on a heavily requested company, the British East India Company. So, this country is fairly similar to the Ottomans in, in the sense that it's got issues at the beginning that you have to take care of in order to stabilize the country. So, I'm going to try and divide this video up into several chapters. So you should be able to access those below. Uh, and uh, probably the largest one is going to be dealing with averting the mutiny, which requires two journal entries. So let's get started. Well, actually, before we do that, if you do like the guide, um, please do like, comment, subscribe. And I do have a Discord. Uh, the link should either be in the description or on my YouTube community page if you have any additional questions or just want to make comments to me rather than on the YouTube page. So let's look at the starting situation for the British East India Company. So to start off, you are a dominion of Great Britain, which does require you to pay 10% of your treasury to the overlord, and you're able to start your own diplomatic plays, and you're not forced to join the overlord's wars, which is kind of nice. You're basically an independent nation to a large degree. Now, the East India Company, unlike many other countries, has a series of puppets underneath them, and these guys are forced to join the wars, and they will pay you money. These consist of all the various little lords throughout India, the remains of the Indian princedoms. Now, they're very important because they supply you a lot of troops early on, and they supply you with a good portion of cash. If you look at it, they're income from them almost covers the income we're paying to Britain right now, or rather the crown of Britain. And uh, it's a very frustrating thing to have to deal with the British, but unfortunately, until you solve all your problems, you can't even think about breaking free. I will point out here that there is a decision called the Doctrine of Lapse. You do not want to use this a ton early, you can. What it does is when you use it, you basically can take over one of the provinces owned by these minor nations. It'll select two. You can pick them. The reason you don't want to use it too much is it does give you, it does damage your reputation, raises your infamy level. You have to conquer and expand quite a lot as the East India Company, so you don't necessarily want to get more infamy than you need. You have enough time in the game to consolidate all of them without rushing it early on. Besides, most of the land you get is not particularly valuable. It'll mainly give you more troops, which, honestly, it's easier to bring in the people uh, to your wars, bringing their own troops, than have to pay for them yourself. Outside of that, the East India Company basically controls most of modern-day India into the Burmese and area. It also controls modern-day Bangladesh and a little bit of modern-day Pakistan and Basically, one of your missions is to consolidate, or journal entries, is to consolidate uh, most of the rest of Pakistan. Outside of that, there are two little enclaves down here in your south. There's Portuguese Goa, and there's um, Pondicherry, owned by the French. Honestly, just ignore them and don't worry about them. Uh, they tend not to cause any trouble. The only annoying thing is sometimes French, France will join defensive wars, but you can usually beat them. The reason is, the British East India Company is actually a military powerhouse. You bring 110 battalions yourself, and you can by and large support them, and your subjects each bring 10 to 20 troops. Um, so it's quite possible your early game wars will have like 250 or more troops attacking nations that are smaller. Also, you have all the way up to line infantry at the beginning, but very quickly you can get skirmish infantry as these guys, and I do recommend it. It basically will ensure dominance in this whole region for ages. So let's look at um, how you have to get through these two journal entries. So you have a disaster here. In fact, we'll go into here because it gives you a better just, uh, it really doesn't. Avert mutiny. You have to complete Consolidate Colonial Rule, which we have, and Reform the Indies Journal Entry. Now, Reform the Journal Entries is not here at the moment. We'll get to that once we unpause. If you don't complete Avert Mutiny, most of your subjects will revolt, and basically you'll be done as a nation unless you win it. It's You can win, uh, especially if you've been slowly annexing lands and stuff, but by and large, it's just a pain. 
You have 20 years to complete it. It doesn't tell you that anywhere else, so I'm highlighting it here. And uh, this is one way, one of the two things you have to do. Unlike the Ottomans, you actually have to fight, and fight quite a lot. You have to conquer at least seven regions. So we'll talk about where to go. So since we have to own basically, oh, here, if we zoom in this, I'll highlight them. So Burma, Kachin, Shan States, Pegu. Basically, you have to conquer Burma. Outside of that, conquer Sindh, the Punjab, Kashmir, and Pashtunistan. I've got it wrong. Pashtunistan area of the Sikh Empire. Baluchistan here, and now I will note that this is probably the hardest one to get because Baluchistan is owned by three separate countries, including Oman, and then the Himalayas, which is also controlled by three countries. Less of a pain, but you have to take out Nepal, Sikkim, and Bhutan. This is not hard because they tend to defend each other, but this one can become a pain because then you have to deal with other nations out here. Now, taking all that into account, there is one major threat, and you might notice it to the north, that is the Great Qing of China and their little puppet Tibet. They tend to be rather defensive of your expansion to both Burma and the Sikh, and they're one of the more likely nations to oppose you along with France. All of this taken together means you need to expand, but you need to be careful how you expand and how quickly you expand. After running several test plays, there are two nations you potentially want to attack early on. So the Sikh Empire up here has 100 battalions. It is actually in decent shape. Burma, on the other hand, has 50. It is relatively easy to conquer. It's up to you which you go for first. If you go for Sikh, you've got a pretty good shot of beating them, but there's a very good chance that the Chinese will get involved. Whereas if you go from Burma... Assuming you manage to start a war and they don't back down, which tends to happen, uh, you can get four provinces. Now, if you're going to go for Burma first, I do recommend researching general staff, probably as your first technology, just so that you get those skirmish infantry making the war against Sikh, the Sikh Empire, and potentially the Great Qing much easier. So, start a diplomatic play. Now, remember... You have to add war goals when you start a war. So we'll start one for, we'll go for Pegu. And there's a reason I'm saying go for this region first. The reason you potentially want to go for this region, if you go for Burma first, you can go for the Sikh Empire. And I'll talk about that. If you go for this first, you, assuming they back down, which in my experience, they back down quite a lot. This will cut off sea access to this area, meaning if you start a future war and someone like France intervenes, the only place France can deploy troops is here. They will not be able to deploy them on the main battleground, meaning you can eat, you can still piece these guys out without having to fight the French army. Obviously, you'll still be fighting the French down here or wherever else they may land, but it's much easier. Now, I will note here that if you start a conquest war against them, we believe these countries may side with us, Great Britain. If you can pull this off, this is really useful because Great Britain is a military monster. On the other hand, if you delay attacking the Sikh Empire for a little bit, the Chinese will get their opium war penalty, making the, if they decide to intervene, making their troops significantly weaker. So let's process forward just a couple days here. I know we're not constructing anything, and you'd want to construct something. Um, okay, I was hoping that journal entry would pop up. Oh, here it is. Reform the Indies. So this is the other one you have to complete to avoid the mutiny. You have to improve your GDP by 50. Honestly, it's not hard. You already start with mercantilism unlocked, meaning all you have to do is change from land-based taxation, get rid of serfdom, and ban slavery. It's actually quite tricky to do this. Um, early on, you have some support for banning serfdom, almost none for banning slavery. And first off, you have to change from traditionalism to change uh, your land-based taxation, unless you go backwards, which you don't want to do. Meaning you have to find a way to change traditionalism. The odds of you doing so will be agrarianism, which you'll pretty much need the rural folk, industrialists, and trade unions to get stronger, while the landholders get weaker. So one of the first things I would recommend to do is to try and get another 
um, group into your government if you can. The Royal Folk aren't great, but they do unlock a couple different options for you to do. You can try and get a professional army done early on. If you do, that does weaken the landholder's political strength quite a bit. The other stuff you can look at trying to pull off is you can definitely pass the police force laws here. Um, be aware that the cost of an institution is huge for India. So this might not be your best move. And since right now it's not giving any support to anybody, it's fine to pull it off. Put it off for now. Honestly, your best bet might be to try and get another group in the government and try to abolish serfdom or wait a while and try and change from autocracy to landed voting. Now, you're going to need another interest group to be boosted, where going in and boosting the, either the industrialists or the intelligentsia might be smart. In my experience, the industrialists seem to be the focus of the East India Company. You get a lot of events and stuff that will boost their power. So boosting them early on is not a bad thing. And then it's mainly a matter of passing the laws. Um, I found the hardest thing to do was actually to ban slavery. It was the last thing I did um, in two of my runs. One run I finished it with like 12 months to spare. That tells you how close it is with some bad luck. Serfdom is not particularly hard to ban. Um, no one really is a huge fan of serfdom. So banning it does not cause too much trouble. It just has a very low success rate. Obviously, if you get a positive event, the odds of you passing it go up, and you should pass it. Otherwise, if you go to hit zero, change it, go for like professional army or something. And uh, that's pretty much it for the law stuff. You don't really want to do any colonial affairs stuff. Yes, it would be nice to try and get some like rubber plantations and stuff, but the reality is you need to focus on India, and India alone will be um, quite a powerhouse. So, just a quick review here, since we're moving on from the averting the mutiny. You're going to either want to invade the Sikh or Burma early on. If you go for Burma, go for Pegu. If you go for the Sikh, go for everything. So, start your diplomatic play. Conquer. We'll just set this up now. Don't forget to go in and add war goals. Take all of Burma, uh, uh, all of the Sikh empire in the first war. Um, it's worth it. Then... If you're expecting Britain to join, you have to go to Sway companies first and give them an obligation to join. It's totally fine to give them the obligation since you already work for them. There's nothing they can use the obligation on except persuading you not to join uh, or scheme against them. Then you simply mobi mobilize your troop. Be aware there are several fronts here, which is really kind of weird. Um, it's not doesn't make sense. It feels like it should just all be one front, but it's not. Raise another... Oh, actually, we don't have another general to raise at this point. Um, I thought we did. Maybe once we process forward, it might add one. Suffice to say, Britain will now join us. We're going to have superior troops. Honestly, our big hope is these guys don't back down, because if they do, it becomes harder. You actually want the war. If you wait longer, um, the odds of you actually getting the war seem to go up. Okay. Other things to, uh, we're going to move on from this. I'll probably process this off screen. Um, you're going to want to improve relations with France, uh, probably China, and definitely Great Britain if you can. Um, you probably will not have enough diplomatic points because you have all these puppets. You're going to want to maintain a decent level of influence. So honestly, you could probably not improve relations with China and just ignore them because they're going to hate you anyway for your conquests. What you want is a good portion of uh, influence so that you can lower your infamy faster over time. Because as you see, we got 51 just from demanding this entire country, meaning if we hit 100, there will be great powers that can start to cut down the size play. And they tend to occur in Europe. So like Prussia versus Great Britain or Austria versus Great Britain. There's very little you can do to affect those wars, even with your great amount of troops, just because of how much better the European troops and stuff are, making it very hard for you to avoid being cut down to size, because the war will be versus Great Britain, not versus you. So if they lose, you will get cut down to size, and it's the end of your game. Let's just put it that way. 
So we've got that diplomatic play set up. Let's talk about the economy now. So India has multiple natural modifiers, and it's worth pointing these out. They have a lot of natural harbors along their coastline, but the big thing they have is various agricultural modifications. There's the Ganges River here, and it goes across the Ganges River, and it adds infrastructure, which is nice, meaning you can delay getting railroads and stuff to a later point. Also, various areas through here will have like the Indus Valley output. Right now, obviously, we don't control these, but you have to conquer them anyway, so it's worth mentioning. Plenty of natural harbors and stuff, the Kaveri Delta, etc. Over here, you've got Burmese teak, which will give you more hardwood, which is quite nice. Um, and as you expand further into Burma, you'll get more. So if we look at it right now, the big bonus areas we have is right here in the Bengal Delta, because we have a agricultural throughput bonus, meaning this province is pretty much one of the best in the entire game for agriculture. Most of India's wealth comes from agriculture rather than coming from manufacturing for a long time. And part of the reason is it's easier to build up if you focus agriculture rather than industry at the beginning because you're part of the giant, bigger British market. Um, meaning what you build really doesn't affect the market prices unless you build a ton of them. So let's look at what we have here. And First off, we have a lot of arms industry scattered throughout our lands. It's very decentralized, but you have an arms industry basically every other state or two, which is, I didn't know India was such a big arms producer at this time, uh, assuming that's accurate. So in Bengal, we have 15 construction. Now we have two options here. We can shift to iron frame buildings, which gives us a ton of construction and state construction efficiency, but requires more money. Or you just stay with the wooden frame buildings and instead you build more construction sectors. I've tested it both ways and at least early on iron frame buildings are worth way more. Just make sure you still build one to two construction sectors. Um, probably one to start. If you look at how drastic the price increase is here, six, if we do it again, 39. So just build one. Um, you'll still have a decent construction rate. Afterwards, I recommend throwing down one logging camp here first, um, just because it will slightly affect the British industry for wood, and then you'll know what the benefits of building wood elsewhere. You've got all your various different agriculture buildings here. Really, the only stuff you're missing is like sugar and rubber for food. There's a couple others, but those are the big ones. So out of all this, what do you build? Well, opium is going to be probably the best choice for you early on. If you can, you can see that all will give benefits, including the bananas. But what I find is that opium is probably the best. So I recommend, honestly, building like 30 op 31 opium buildings. I believe at the start you have a throughput bonus of 30, unlike most countries would start with 20. Um, let's see, does it tell us here? Economy of scale. Nope, right now it's 20. It will quickly expand to 30. So just build 20 of these, or build 30 if you want to. What I find is these build quickly and they give you enough money. If you want to build something else other than opium, dye is really good, as well as um, tea and coffee, because the British always demand tea and coffee. Be aware you will fill up your infrastructure here super fast. So definitely go in and throw down a... Um, road maintenance edict on this to reduce the use of your infrastructure. It'll help a little bit. It won't solve the problem, but it'll give you longer before you need to worry about railroads. And honestly, once you're done with that, you're going to just want to... Probably you don't want to build really any other factories in South Bengal. Just build up these. Instead, build those other factories up here where you're not going to build as many uh, agriculture buildings because they don't have the biggest benefit, or this does in this case. Um, actually, they both do. Huh, I didn't notice that. Um, up here, Assam does not have any of those bonuses. Still has a large enough population that you should start throwing some factories and stuff down. Honestly, though, India has way too many population, way too much population. So anything you build anywhere, the odds of you running out of population are pretty slim. 
actually here's a good one central india here has a guard good portion of population does not have any um agricultural huge bonuses it's got a 10 but your others have 15 or more so you could easily build up there and plus at some point you'll start taking land from other empires and stuff uh let's see what other things to note uh, you've got a state here, Ceylon, that's not incorporated. It's worth incorporating it from the beginning, just getting it over and done with. It'll provide some taxes. And since it's already got a small functioning industry, it's worth doing. Once you build up uh, South Bengal with opium plantations, honestly, just you can throw down a couple it, um, factories, but the reality is the best thing for you to do is really just build... Uh, agricultural buildings, they're going to be way more useful to building up your GDP. Because then you don't have to educate your population. They can start working there immediately. And then you become the good supplier for the entire British market. So when you try and leave it late game, it just crashes their entire economy. <laughs> okay, so I haven't unpaused yet, but let's talk about some unique and rather annoying events India gets. So... India has issues between the Muslims and the Hindus and the British, who are all have different religions. You will get periodically events about um, having pig oil, pig grease used at oil stuff for the Muslim soldiers, and they'll be unhappy. And you'll have to make decisions about that. Um, pick the best one. Try not to create too many radicals for yourself. Um, it's quite possible to have a massive amount of radicals and almost no loyalists, which is never a good sign. And um, you also get some uh, flooding events periodically, but the big one will come around 1850 something. Krakatoa will erupt. Krakatoa being somewhere down here will explode. It will cause um and it will cause you to either have a huge reduction in farm output or pay a ton of money. You'll receive a huge agriculture output uh, negative modifier because the the cloud the soot will literally block the sun. So expect to see your economy absolutely crash. It tends to occur not long after you avert mutiny, like within the next two to three years. So that puts it around 58 or so. Uh, and it will just cause absolute havoc throughout this whole area of Asia. So be aware of that. I went from having positive 40k income to negative 98 due to various additional expenses popping up. And obviously I was trying to pay for them to see how bad it could get. They only last like four years, but it can be very devastating to your economy if you're not ready. So definitely don't fall into debt and try and build up a bit of reserve by the time you're averting the mutiny. So before we move on, let's talk about technology. So I've already said general staff is probably what you want to go for first, just in case you need the skirmish infantry to fight, say like the French later or the Chinese, this will put you on par or better than them and you can absolutely wipe them. Once you're done with that, that's pretty all, pretty much all you need to research for the military tab for some time. Definitely ignore the naval tab. You're not a naval power. In terms of society, you're in decent shape. I would highlight central archives here and central banking as stuff to build. Central archives will allow you to um, increase your bureaucracy output which will help a lot with integrating the new states you're going to conquer, as well as getting institutions going. And central banking is just the minting and interest. It's just almost free money. Um, psychiatry can be worth it because it does reduce the bureaucracy population cost modifier. Other than that, pretty much ignore everything else. You're going to get a nice technology spread from the British and... Uh, you're going to be focused too much on building up your economy and reforming your government to worry too much about research early on. In terms of your production, intens intensive agriculture is great because you're going to be doing a lot of farming stuff. Mechanized tools is also good. Atmospheric engine is amazing for your mines. Other than that, some of these you'll get spread automatically. But remember, you're going to want to clear up each level of the technology before you move on to the next or suffer a huge uh, technology cost. You can get railroads 
honestly, you don't really need railroads for some time uh, unless you're over centralizing, which you're going to be pretty busy just trying to stay positive income and everything else first. Uh, make sure that you turn on your buildings to um, automatically upgrade in case you at some point have free production capacity. And make sure to adopt stuff like hardwoods production and sawmills because despite having the technology to build it, the Indian economy isn't taking advantage of it, which is rather annoying when you look at it. So definitely go through, adjust all of these. Like leaded glass isn't being done. These are stuff that honestly the game should put on at the beginning. Market squares is great. Gas street lights is great. Just be aware that it's going to take a while for the qualifications to come through. And it does start requiring coal, but it should help with your economy. In terms of your budget, you're paying your people fairly. If you're going to adopt a consumption tax, put it on services probably. Just be aware it's going to use up your authority and you want high authority so you can try and pass laws faster. Plus, at this point, we're already boosting the industrialists. Okay, I am going to start skipping forward now at this point so that we can get through these events and you can see progress towards reforming the Indies. So here, in fact, is one of these events. I just unpaused for like five days and got this. This is an issue where the Hindu faith says not to cross seas. You can either have them be allowed to not fight abroad or you can make them fight abroad. Be aware that it makes them more radical. So at least initially, don't send them abroad. So actually, you know what? I'll just let this play out here because there's really no reason not to. No one is supporting these guys. It's quite possible they just back down, which would be unfortunate. Technically, Great Britain's launching the war. Ah, here's the Forbidden Greece one. Tallow and lard, taboo and Hindu and uh, Muslim face. You can either, the soldiers won't find out, or we must make modifications. This is going to kill your economy, but the risk of offending a massive amount of your population might not make it worth it. So let's see. I assume, oh, they backed down, which is unfortunate because we wanted the war. This is where if you wait, you might have a better chance of doing so. On the other hand, it doesn't cost uh, infamy. So now we'll do the same thing to Burma, making sure to go for this province in the south. We shouldn't need Great Britain to side with us here, so I'm not going to push for it. Just simply raise the troops and deploy them. And we do have another general here as well, but we're not going to mobilize them. And as you'll see, we've already got the construction stuff going on. It's now very expensive, but we're building opium plantations like they're going out of style. And they're making 12.5 a year, so it's quite productive. Now, is anyone going to help them? Yes. Okay, other people are going to help them, which means we need the other troop. We'll deploy these in the south. We shouldn't... Um, be too worried at this point. None of the major nations have gotten involved. Both of these are pretty easy to crush. This one is going to be a little annoying because we'll have to expand through the countries to piece them out. But And Burma gave up. Perfect. You'll see a lot of backing down if you do it right. So Sindh will go for that. In fact, I should have demanded more from Burma, but I forgot. So we'll raise and deploy our troops. You'll see all these troops that rush forward to the battle. Those are all our subjects. It's great, isn't it? Our little vassals, all the British, uh, all the Indian Raj. Let's see, how are our opium plantations? They're doing quite well. Oh wait, I should be reform. Oh, oh, we're still trying to abolish serfdom. Okay, they back down as well, which gives us more land. Now we have got some new new states. It's worth starting incorporating them when you can. Um, just honestly, because if you don't, the uh, that once you start, it takes like twenty plus years. So we're infamous, but we still have enough. So we're going to make a diplomatic play to conquer the Himalayas if we're lucky. Um, these guys may join the other sides. Let's see. 
We can't get Britain on this war, so this could be a little bit risky. Uh, oh. We're going to cut through some of the red tape to keep our odds up. Unfortunately, it's expensive. Anyone joining them? Yes, someone is joining them. Perfect. Conquer state. The tiny little province, a uh, uh, country of Sikkim. If we're lucky, someone else. Ah, Bhutan is joining. Let's see if we can take Bhutan as well. Okay. So now, hopefully, there's a war here. I'd feel bad to start all this up and not actually fight anybody. Be aware that the land you've just taken is not using the most modern production techniques. As you expand, you're going to have to keep going through this and adjusting your tech. It's honestly quite annoying. I wish the game defaulted to automatically making it use the best production methods, but it doesn't. See stuff like this, these logging camps and stuff. Okay, please give me a war here. I want a war. Well, actually, I really don't. It's easier if we don't have a war, but it does slow down our progress towards consolidating our rule. It looks like they are not going to back down, which is actually perfect. This should be, honestly, rather easy for us to win. Yeah, we're going to win. Oh, it would help if I actually deployed my troops, wouldn't it? Oops. We'll just quickly deploy them. We're still doing quite well with our opium plantations down here. Look at all that money it's making. Pretty crazy how much people want them. Um. Yeah, we'll say we wanted to do war with them later. We're going to say we want all these war goals. Now we pretty much just wait for the peace deal to come out. And we actually are going to throw down a single government uh, admin. There we go. Conquered one province, conquered another, conquered another. So just like that, we've consolidated four provinces. Keeping separatism below 10 takes a while, but it's quite doable. And uh, at this point, we could theoretically go after Baluchistan, but three whole wars is quite a lot. It's probably, at this point, safer to wait, let this tick down, and go after these guys again. China is suffering from their opium addiction for three years, but we can't fight these guys for another four, unfortunately. Meaning, at that point, China will probably join against us. Okay. We have moved fifteen year, uh, five years forward. We or several years forward. We're fifteen years away. We still haven't yet a second war against the Seek and stuff. We've been building up opium here. We've up to forty three, and we're still making money. It it's so so much money. It's worth building. Um, we failed to get rid of slavery and serfdom. So, but we did manage to pass professional army, and we're working on agrarianism. And uh, that's pretty much it. We're sitting, letting the uh, infamy tick down. Okay, update. So it's now 10 years further. We attempted more conquests against both Burma and the Sikh, but they backed down both times. Honestly, in my other games, they never backed down, which made this a lot easier. Uh, we're one away from consolidating colonial rule. Reforming the Indies is going pretty well. We've managed to pass professional army. We're passing agrarianism. Um, we're not having any... We managed to abolish serfdom, but we haven't managed to abolish slavery or change from uh, land-based taxation yet. But it looks like we're on the way there. Also, I don't know if my game did it or I just totally missed it. You've already got... I've got 25 opium plantations in Bidhar here. Bihar. Um, if that's the case at the beginning of the game, and 
I don't realize why I didn't check that. Uh, it's better to build up the opium plantations there than in South Bengal. Build something else down here. Probably die. Um, that's about it. I've started using Doctrine of Lapse periodically now to consolidate uh, India. We are still very no uh, notorious, so it was probably the right idea to delay as long as I did. Okay, another update. We just consolidated colonial rule with the conquest of the Sikh Empire. It involved a multi-faceted war. We get this lovely event. We can either improve relations with our subjects, or we can gain industrialist political strength and interest group approval. Honestly, the interest group power is probably more useful here because it will allow you to pass the remaining laws that we need. In this case, we're working on per capita taxation. We're smashing, smashing Baluchistan here. Shouldn't be that hard. Um, I did want to get this Omari land, so let's quick get a general in place to do that. Uh, naval invasion there. Yeah, naval invade one province, but hey. Even if we won't get all the land theoretically we needed to get Makran here, um, we'll have taken almost everything else with the exception of two Burmese lands, which, as you saw, this has literally been, what, the second war we fought? And we've conquered a lot of area. It's pretty easy to do more. Um, Two naval invasions to make sure that we can piece these guys out, gain the province, and then if we want, we'll go for Makran there, and probably back to Burma. Um, and did we get... Nope, we did not get that one. Ah. Well, we'll get per capita next time, and then I believe all that's left for me to do here is slavery, um, which is going to be quite the struggle. Okay, we have... Oof. 35 months to avert the mutiny, but we just banned slavery, which will complete, reform the Indies, give us a choice to get the ethical policy and also get capitalist investment pool, or we can make use of local labor, which gets qualifications. Honestly, this is the better one, gets you potentially more money. And at this point, the next goal, once that's done, um, if we look over here, is the ethical policy. Um, basically, get the standard of living to 15 and a literacy rate of greater than 50. You start, you've got 25 or so by this point. I haven't built any universities, so this is where you should be. Um, and you got to get standard of living up by four of your 156 million, of which I've only managed to employ 6 million of. It's not an easy one. The benefit is not like game breaking the only thing i can say that would help you get there is build lots of universities at least one in every province and then centralize um and also passing your um, education laws get schools ideally public schools if you can um making sure of course not to have any more bureaucracy problems than you already have and keep expanding into burma and stuff and anyway uh, I basically followed exactly what I told you guys. We haven't even bothered to get railroads. It's 1853, but we've gotten a lot of production, kept up on society, pretty much ignored military. And at this point, we've got some debt because um, we were running into debt um, due to an additional expense from a flood relief down in uh, Assam or something. And uh, once that goes away, we'd be positive again, and we're constructing stuff, so we're getting the investment pool. Considering your investment pool, if you've gone agrarianism, which I did, um, will be farms and other agrarian stuff, make sure to definitely um, uh, deploy more of those. And that's about it. It's uh, not the hardest one. Honestly, I found the Ottomans to be a bit trickier. Uh, at this point, you're so strong. I mean, I'm ranked eight as a great power here, but the reality is I'm ranked four ahead <laughs> of stuff like Russia. Theoretically, I could make a play for independence against Great Britain if I wanted to. Probably wouldn't be worth it, though. It's At this point, it's almost easier to stand a Great Britain while conquering these areas. Uh, in one of my other games, I conquered most of China um, with relative ease using Great Britain's help and the fact that Chinese are militarily backwards. 
I will note that I did have to change from total separation to freedom of conscious consciousness uh, just so that the landholders wouldn't revolt every time I did slavery. The benefit of that is it slowly will convert your country to Protestantism or Catholicism or any of the Anglicanism or whatever. But uh, it does mean that I'm discriminating against the vast majority of my Hindu populace. In the long run, I'd probably go back to total separation and work towards multiculturalism to fully tolerate all the countries in India, as well as keeping revoking the doctrine of lapse and consolidate it all, and hopefully not dying to when the Krakatoa explosion massively increases your um, additional expenses. So in conclusion, expand into the Sikh and Burma. I almost ideally you want a war rather than the British helping you. Ways to trigger wars, muster less troops. Um, at the start of the war, don't invite Great Britain in. The risk is, of course, then you have to fight China. You can beat China if you get skirmish infantry. And then outside of that, just muster tons of your troops against all the little minor ones like Baluchistan and anyone else you want to invade, and they cave almost immediately. You could even make a push against someone like Portugal here, uh, except they're defensive again with Austria and intimidate them into giving up because Portugal doesn't have a military. France, on the other hand, would require a full war. However, this is a nice little small province. If you take it, France has issues making naval landings, so it's pretty easy to control it, especially if you get Britain to join your war. And at that point, India is yours. And honestly, all of Asia really is. You're the only great power in asia to be honest that can afford to keep expanding and conquering in the area you're rich you're powerful you're india the hardest part is honestly passing the laws i never had really any trouble with separatism um once i got the i changed institutions here to get the police force this helped a lot with just controlling some of our radical growth however if you look at it only 77 thousand people approve of our government where 35 million hate us that will change is now that we're not changing laws constantly um, it, things should get more stable this is what the laws looked like at the end the big key is to get landed voting when you can breaks the power of the nobility uh, professional army helped with that and then it was just a matter of trying it again i had slavery banned i think i did it four times before i got it passed and um, have fun it's not a very hard nation once you survive the mutiny. You can do whatever you want. World's your oyster. Have fun. Thank you for watching. If you watch it all, subscribe, like, comment, check out my Discord, all that good stuff. I've got channel memberships if anyone's crazy enough to donate monthly. And uh, I hope to see you guys all in another video, Let's Play, or live stream. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.